dramatic effect on just the whole cultural participation of women and the and the images of women as uh, singers, uh, masqueraders, people who are deeply involved in carnival. And so many of you have probably heard of these women who are in the room, Alison Hines, Patricia Roberts, Drupati, Calypso Rose, um, Denise Belfont, and of course, none other than Denise Plummer. Women coming from different ethnicities in Trinidad, different coming from different social classes, uh, became keynote Calypsonians in an industry that was predominantly um, uh, 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 done by men in prior uh, decades. Uh, our most famous one, I think, our most uh, sort of legendary one is Clipsa Rose. And of course, uh, Patrice Roberts has certainly sort of come in as also being a legendary. These women now have transnational audiences, um, which means essentially that they'll be doing events in places like France, in Canada, in New York, in Miami, and the population is the, who they go to sing to um, clearly see them as being um, now legends, uh, just like the men who have become legends like um, Sparrow, Kitchen, Lord Kitchener, and of course, just the late um, Black Stellan. I want to start off by um, uh, using the lyrics of um, Destra in a, in a very um, a famous song she has uh, written and actually performed called Lucy. And the lyrics to the song really sort of typify the ways in which um, Caribbean women have now positioned themselves as not being afraid any longer what people think of them on the road and, and sort of uh, doing their own thing. So give me one second now and I'll stop share this and I'll share. I, uh, we're not going to watch the whole YouTube. We'll, we'll just watch a very short section of it. And let me share my sound. So if you want to turn up your speakers, this is going to be nice. So let's have Destra. Again, it's made as a sort of a cartoon, so. I grew up as a real good girl, always home, don't go nowhere. As soon as I was introduced to Carnival, they say I lose all down on the ground. Walking, walking up the bottom and it dragging, dragging all over tongue and they say I lose it. Was never a party at my school bazaar. Okay, so we've got a little taste of uh, Lucy, and uh, you clearly see here that Destra is using the word loose in a double entendre, which means that she is clearly using the word to suggest to us that being loose is actually being outgoing, to actually push men, in a sense, to see you as uh, being somebody who is beyond <laughs> just this idea of somebody who is sexually available. So to understand that context of where Destra comes from that song, we, we need to go back in history a little bit. We need to uh, sort of understand where women's position in carnival actually fits. So I want you to imagine the 18th and 19th century of carnival beginning as a sort of inversion of the hierarchical structures and the establishment of a sort of upside down world prior to Lent. Right, so Lent becomes the the time period where you where you fast and you don't uh, ex you know experience um, um, the the sort of um, 
evocative, uh, outlandish things, you, 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 you sacrifice. So, as we all know, I hope, is that in the 19th century, Carnival itself established itself as part of the mainstay of places like Trinidad. It would eventually reach places like Aruba. It would eventually reach other parts of the world. But really, uh, Carnival um, originates in Europe originally, gets transported with the French uh, to the so-called New World. And essentially, in 19th century Trinidad, then, we also have various caricatures emerging within the Carnival Mass itself. So people would actually dress in certain types of costumes, uh, evoking certain um, themes, devils, um, people playing baby dolls, people playing um, uh, other sorts of um, um, mystical figures. One individual figure in all of this was called the Jemet. And in Trinidad, the Jemet was a figure was often played by women. And oftentimes these Jemets were considered as sort of a, and for that day, the abomination of sort of make, poking fun at the elite. And so the Jemets, lack of morality, fidelity, exposure to Victorian sort of cultural standards and sexual mores of the time gets reversed. And so the Jemet legacy, I would argue, still sort of exists even today in a sort of hegemonic unconscious um, situation in Trinidad society. And so today the sort of boundaries of uh, morality and acceptability um, have certainly permeated into carnival. And we have new sort of terms that describe these sort of women as uh, jacobats or scatels or skanks or sluts. And again, I want you to sort of imagine this becomes over time uh, a sort of a label that women actually will use on carnival day, uh, two days that is, and essentially twist it, uh, make it into something of a badge of honor as opposed to it being what the dominant society wants to do to them is make them feel bad about it. And so for Carnival and Caribbean women today, um, they sort of overthrow the patriarchal stereotypes that depict women as sexually available and they maintain their own, what we refer to now as agency. That is, they control their own circumstance despite themselves um, provocatively dressing in a certain costume and being um, available, quote unquote, on the road, but they're actually not available. I wanna stop there for that part of the presentation. I'm now gonna now just talk very, very briefly about Caribbean people arriving in Canada. So Caribbean people essentially were able to come to Canada in about 1968. And there was a major uh, change in policy in 1967 which, gave, which previously had given a lot of preference to European people coming to Canada. And they adopted something called a point system. So immigrants coming to Canada could qualify based on certain criteria of their own personalities. So age became a criteria. Uh, if you had a skill level, if you were had spoke um, uh, English or French, um, sometimes you could also qualify as a refugee. We also had a domestic worker policy that also allowed uh, people to qualify. So essentially what happened is after 1967, a whole new influx of people of color, particularly from the Caribbean region, were able to gain access to Canada. And those who came often also left people behind. So we often refer to those as barrel children. These were children who would receive remittances from their mothers or, or often uh, family members who left, but would still take care of them and eventually get them and, and bring them to Canada also. So this graphic very clearly demonstrates that there's a real um, uh, you know, increase in 68 um, for immigration to Canada. And essentially there'd be some more peaks and valleys, but let me look more specifically now at the Caribbean groups. So you can see here this massive bulge that starts taking place right here. And this bulge for um, people coming from Jamaica, from Trinidad, from Barbados, um, from Guyana, all sort of arrive in a period, a window of time, 1970 to about the late 1990s, and then the sort of a, a downward trend after that. We, we're not going to go into the, in detail, but what essentially that creates is a diasporic community living in Canada. And so Caravana then, now let's switch over and talk about Caravana itself as a festival, actually began in 1967 when Canada was celebrating what we referred to then back then as its centennial birthday. Canada turned 100 years of independence from Great Britain. It was at that time the Canadian government approached 
uh, the West Indian community at the time, and asked them to, what could they contribute to this festival called Expo 67. And so this was originally a festival that was meant to showcase Trinidadian carnival music, culture and art, in, including costume making and steel band playing on the roads. It was supposed to be a one-off event. It wasn't supposed to happen again, but the event was so successful that after 1967, 1968, and up to the very present, in 2022, we've had parades and we've had the festival now become an institutional part of the Canadian culture, more specifically Toronto culture. Originally, the parade routes were, were changed over time. Uh, they went down one street one, at one point, and now eventually um, it has now come to become a festival connected to the time period of August and emancipation of slaves. Um, and so this becomes now a, a festival that is well entrenched in Canadian and more specifically Toronto culture that people come to expect and uh, revere. So what also happened over time was that these events in Toronto came to parallel the events that were going on in the original carnival that people were coming from and actually wanting to um, reproduce. That included um, uh, uh, Calypso competitions, it involved fets, parties, it involved competitions, um, pan playing, um, block parties, uh, storytelling, plays, and so forth and so on. And these all became culminated to the sat the very first Saturday of, of, of the month of August, which then also culminated with emancipation of slavery. So this became the way in which people started to uh, connect the caravana with something that was very historical. So at this point now, I just want to play you another short clip, and this clip will have in it a, an example of what that very first carnival looked like. So let me pull this up. Let me now share my screen with you. Again, give me a second to flip over. Share my screen. So again, this was uh, some very early footage of the very first 1967 carnival in the city of Toronto. share. Let's come back to my presentation. So what you can see there is clearly that um, uh, the early celebration of Caravana would have been one that you had a lot of um, spectators from the dominant group standing on the sides. You also had that um, population of Caribbean people, um, again, taking over the streets and celebrating and seeing themselves um, for the very first time actually having a role in Canadian society. So let's now play our, our, our newest clip, and our newest clip will show us what that early parade has now become. So let, give me a second again to transition over with that one. Okay, let's now share. Share my screen. Okay, so this would give you, and again, I'll talk through this as we're going through this very, this will be the very last clip I'll show. This is 2022. So what I want you to take notice of as we're looking at this, is I want you to take notice of the body sizes of people. I want you to notice that people are carrying flags. I want you to notice the size of the band themselves. I want you to make note of how many men are actually involved in the parade. I also want to have you look at the ways in which people have really spent a lot of time in their costumes. They've matched their whole selves, their eyelashes, their shoes. Let's just take a couple of up here. Sorry, it's buffering. Okay, come on. Okay.
going to stop that. And we're going to come back now to the presentation. I just wanted to give you a quick uh, look at what Caravana has become versus what it was um, in the earlier part of the uh, the turn of the into the 1970s. So you can see it's become a very grand affair. And you can see clearly that um, you've got uh, lots of people participating now. Some bands have now reached the point of 5,000 people in one band. Uh, you've got situations now where you've got multiple bands. The entire festival itself parade takes, it starts at nine o'clock in the morning and it finishes at six o'clock in the evening. And throughout all that, you've got people moving through the streets. You've got approximately about a million people now that come to uh, experience the festival um, in the downtown, um, we call it the waterfront area. So it's become a big event. And you've got, of course, a lot of emphasis put on uh, personal appearance from the participants. Uh, you'll notice just from that picture alone in front of you now that you would see that women spend a great deal in terms of time and precision in terms of getting the right sunglasses, getting the right um, uh, you know, adornments to make themselves look special and, and unique. Uh, what you'll also notice too is lots of people carrying flags. Ethnic ethnic identity is really important for Caribbean folks in this big festival because it beca has become so large. You'll have Guyanese, you'll have Jamaicans, you'll have Trinidadians, you'll have Vincentians, et cetera, uh, Grenadians. But they're not very few of them will have, actually ever carry a Canadian flag and wave it. They're all carrying a flag that they have come to um, um, be part of as a growing up experience, and they still want to manifest the differences within the various islands. Even though most people who are watching the parade don't necessarily care, this is something that's really, really important to them to make sure that people recognize them as being different ethnicities. So what I want to now take you on is a sort of a little journey. And the journey itself is based on what we refer to as ethnographic research. What I've done in my ethnographic research over the decades of time, I've been a participant myself in both um, a place called um, the Saldina Mass Camp, which is actually a, the largest band group that actually is part of uh, Caravana. They had 5,000 revelers in 2022. Um, uh, I also want to use my um, um, f uh, camera as a way of bringing you there into the various uh, events that take place. So you might ask the question, who is that guy over there on the right-hand side of my screen? Yes, that is me uh, with my own provocative costume. I tend to build my own costume every year and uh, join the Saldina band, so you can see me there. Um, and so my presentation moving forward now, as we come uh, through the meat of it, you will now start seeing um, some of the examples of me um, trying to apply theory, concepts, and ideas to this very important um, situation uh, of caravan, which has a lot of meaning to it. And so let me first start by a theoretical perspective and overview. So let's start with theory. So, Again, um, ethnography is, 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 a, is a, a research approach where I gather information by being a participant within the, within the event. Um, I'm trying to better understand the event by also adding um, my own many years of being trained as a sociologist to have a sociological lens that I can look at these situations uh, in a way and, and add theory to them. Um, and so I'm going to talk now about two different situations, both on the road or in the mass camp. And so what I wanna focus on in the mass camp, when I eventually get to that part of the analysis, I wanna look at who participates in the mass camp, what activities take place there, what kind of conversations are going on there, uh, what informal activities go on there. Um, and again, I also want to also be a mass participant and be able to look on the road of what are the trends, what are the patterns, what are the themes that are going on in the road that we can sort of then add theory and concepts to to better understand it at a sort of a higher level. So when we do think about the mass camp itself, um, what I did is I actually conducted interviews. And these interviews were interviews over many summers where I would actually have people and I'd record them and we would conduct informal focus groups of people. And I would be trying to really understand their meaning of the mass camp itself and what they actually think of, of in terms of um, uh, what they miss, what they try to do, why they participate, and so forth and so on. So overall, I'm going to be reporting on 10 individuals. Um, this individual right here is my wife, uh, and she's a big caravan and carnival woman herself. Um, uh, her family is very much involved in the production of uh, caravan every year. At second, she's actually uh, her uncle, which is just over her shoulder here, um, Hayden Harbin, is a, a promoter from um, 
of this mass camp going back almost uh, uh, 30 or 40 years. So this is just the overview of the people I actually interviewed. Uh, some characteristics about them, most of them were uh, at the time were in their 40s to 50s and older. Um, they oftentimes had uh, various occupations. They were all people who participated in the in the in the, in the mass tent uh, mass camp itself, um, and they all identify themselves as um, uh, African, Black, Indo Caribbean, mixed, or um, people who were actually um, um, uh, Portuguese. So theoretically, then let's take a look at what some of the theories are that actually help to to motivate the research. Before I start showing you very quickly some images and try to theorize what happens during Caravana. So one theorist, uh, Ad, uh, Gloria Atenzula, uh, talks about ethnic and cultural identities as being hybrid, dynamic, fluid, and multi-layered. Uh, another theorist talks about um, nostalgia. Uh, when immigrants go away, they have a sense of a nostalgia, a longing for what they have left behind. Uh, this nostalgia creates a sort of um, ideal where people want to be involved in things that help them reconstruct something they've lost in the past. Other theorists also uh, theorize that immigrants who mi migrate also never forget about home. They don't lose contact with family and friends, and they continue to have connections with community organizations, political movements from back home, and they're very much part of their uh, old societies by um, communicating with family, friends, and acquaintances about uh, the latest information that's going on back home. And part of the reason why they do that is because they feel like outsiders in the country in which they're actually part of. They're not, they don't feel at home in this new place. So as a direct result of another theory called segmented assimilation, then, um, diaspora individuals find themselves uh, in that sort of cultural period of mourning. Um, like something dies um, in the sense that when they're trying to negotiate a space for themselves in this new place, be that Toronto, be that Amsterdam, be that New York City, be that Miami, there's still a sense of loss that people have. And they've experienced a sense of mourning for something that they uh, want to connect with. And so other theorists talk about um, uh, migrants or immigrants having to find bridges to, to, to capture that emotional feeling of loss, that dislocation. And so we often refer to this as uh, migrants having a feeling of object loss that by engaging in certain activities like working in the mass camp or by um, being on the road and participating in caravana or um, some sort of uh, cultural event, that gives them that feeling once again that they matter, that they belong, that they have a, a tribe, a community that they can feel at home in as opposed to um, the one that they actually feel a sense of alienation and a sense of disconnection in these new places where they have settled. And they might have settled in those places for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and yet they still have that empty feeling of not belonging. And what are some of those connections? Well, some of the connections could include uh, food, music, festivals. All these become things that immigrants feel that they can put back in place by participating. And so finally, um, where do they participate? Well, they participate in a specific space. And that space becomes a place where these immigrants who live abroad can engage in activities that sort of bridge those emotional gaps and, 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 and uh, give them a, a sense of belonging. So now let's take a look at just sort of a quick representative model of let's say a female masquerader and what she's trying to do by being on the road and what kind of psychological benefits does she get by participating in this thing called caravana or carnival. Well, let's begin by first saying that it provides her with a sense of mattering and attractiveness. I say attractiveness because oftentimes black women or women of color in general in white spaces often find themselves so marginalized in terms of beauty and ideal and attractiveness that they're actually considered as the ugly ones. The road itself, let's think about the, the actual physical space of being on the lakeshore in Toronto as being a place where now the so-called social order of Canada has been disrupted. It's normally a society that is full of rules, full of orders, full of, you know, people have to participate only in, you know, in certain ways. Well, the road itself becomes a place where these women uh, can feel a sense of um, belonging. The participation they actually participate in 
uh, by wearing a costume and by being on the road itself um, gives the feeling of, uh, again, that you've no longer have lost that object which you desire to have. And so for that time period of uh, 12 or 15 hours that caravan actually takes place on the road, you feel connected. You re reestablish that, that connection to friends, family, uh, fictive kin, people who are just participating and having a great time. And using the caravan as a reunion space where people will come from New York, Miami, Trinidad, Toronto, um, other parts of Canada, um, and come together in uh, in that space for that one day to feel a sense of connection. So let me, I'm not going to read all these quotes. I'm just going to now talk through some of the things that I learned from the people who I interviewed about um, the spaces and the places which they located. And the pictures sort of tell a thousand words for themselves. So when you go to your the to the mass camp, one of the major observations you'll make right away is that the people who are actually making the costumes, and I think the same thing happens in Aruba, are predominantly women. So women are tasked with sewing the beads on, gluing the costumes together, putting the feathers on all the costumes in very intricate ways, and essentially being the assembly line. And so why do they do this? Well, they do it uh, night in and night out for about a, a three-week period because they get together with their friends. They get together and have a sense of um, doing something that will actually create and re reinforce the culture over time. There's a time for gossip, there's a time for sharing food, there's a time for reminiscing about back home. So basically the task of making these costumes is voluntary work. Uh, very few people actually get paid for it, uh, for doing the costume making. It's actually the band leaders who actually make the money, it's not the costume makers. But again, people love the mask so much they actually participate in it. Over the years, um, women have actually replaced men in terms of being the section leaders. So in the early years when I used to participate, a lot of the sections were run by men with women doing all the work over time. That's sort of, again, uh, changed. And women are actually the ones who are now, uh, uh, from the very initial period, uh, working with an artist to design the costume, to eventually market the, the section that they want to run. And over time, they become the person who is uh, in charge of the um, that section. Another um, event that we have in, in Toronto is something called Children's Carnival, otherwise known as Kitty's Carnival. It takes place about a week and a half, actually two weeks before the big show. And it's very interesting to go to the Kitty's Carnival and sort of observe the doting and the ways in which women connect with their children who are now part of the third generation. And they encourage their children at a very young age to embrace the culture. And what they're trying to do, of course, um, is trying to expose the children to uh, dance, music, food, um, language of the culture in which the parents can't necessarily um, reproduce in Canada, but they can reproduce it on that one day um, for the children. And essentially it becomes a show for women to show off the children to say, hey, look at my kids. You know, they're participating in this mass competition. They're, they're young. They're oftentimes under uh, 15 years old and the children are actually on the road um, doing what the parents sort of are projecting onto them that the parents want to do themselves. And that is embrace Trinidadian culture, embrace Jamaican culture, have a sense of um, identity that's complicated. Yes, these children were born in Canada, but clearly their parents are trying to encourage them to think about their original roots because as black kids or uh, mixed kids or uh, Indo-Caribbean kids, um, they certainly have a situation where they're oftentimes also demonized by the dominant culture to, to be less than, to be not considered as beautiful, to be considered as, um, uh, you know, um, all this, all the negative stereotypes that are often attached to people of color in these spaces. Well, let's now talk about the ways in which women take over the road in costume. You saw that clip I showed you um, that sort of went to the 2022 Carnival uh, Caravan and sort of just did a whole uh, expose, which you sort of saw masqueraders in different places. Well, one of the things that happens on the day of the event is that the police stand aside. They, they move off to the, to the side of the roads. They just sort of watch for safety. But at the same time, this now becomes the opportunity for women in particular, and men too. I'm not saying men are totally gone. They're certainly there. It's, I would argue that the percentage is about 85% um, women and 15% men or so in terms of the participation rate. And essentially, women get to sort of um, psychologically 
become part of um, uh, a sort of a fantasy uh, day where they in their costumes are noticed by people. They get a chance, people take photographs of them from the sides. They get a chance to dance provocatively. They get a chance to show off their bodies no matter what their bodies look like. And again, I want to emphasize this whole notion of the white European women aesthetic that clearly people of color don't fall into that aesthetic, but on during the Caravana Festival, um, these women get to play out the fantasy of they are being noticed by lots of people and people don't judge their bodies in a way that they would judge uh, them on other days. And so the women get to, again, uh, feel a sense of um, sexiness, a sense of provocativeness, a sense of um, mattering, a sense of uh, being the most important person in the show with the feathers, the beads, and, um, you know, all the provocative uh, accoutrements that go along with it. So the question you might also ask is, what happens to men? Well, it's a very in interesting and important question because men are, yes, they are there, but they've now taken on a much more peripheral role compared to the earlier times when I talked about the 18th century, men now in uh, the Canadian context have now moved to the role of, yes, masqueraders are still there, but they also have moved to the side in the sense many men now volunteer to become marshals or people who are helping with the band as it moves forward for safety. And that's uh, a very interesting role for men to play because it still puts them in the parade, but not in a costume. Again, I wanna to emphasize to you costumes are very expensive. Uh, to begin with, they start at around 200 Canadian dollars uh, for a very bland, uh, uh, sort of uh, not very complicated costume. And they run now all the way up to $800 for a much more provocative, lots of feathers, lots of um, work goes into that, those costumes, etc. So men have sort of divorced themselves from that cost, in a sense, and said, you know what, I'll put on a martial costume and I will still have my fun. Uh, on the side of the road, um, being part of the costume, being part of the mask. So let's take a look at some of the photographs I've included here. Um, again, these are ones that I've taken myself. And over time, um, you see some very interesting trends around the costumes themselves. Um, one of the trends is that costumes are becoming smaller and smaller, meaning that you're seeing less and less material on the costumes. Um, Part of that, again, uh, is a, a, a global trend of women's um, uh, fashions have become much skimpier over time globally. And now it's also being reflected here in the caravan costumes themselves. You also notice that flags are very much predominant in all of those uh, images that I've uh, produced here for you, people carrying their flag to tell you what uh, their place of origin is. Um, also notice a lot of women uh, ended up dancing with each other women because there's such a shortage of men. If you also notice on the side of the road there, on the very first picture on the left-hand side, you'll notice a, a, a fence. So that fence becomes a barrier, physical barrier, between the masqueraders who are on the inside and the public on the outside. Recall I told you about a million people show up for the Caravana Festival? Well, that, millions, that million people are actually on the other side of that barricade and can watch the parade. It's a free parade. It doesn't cost anybody any money to attend, but it also allows this area on the inside of the, um, the barricade, which I refer to as the road, it now becomes the stage, the theater can take place there. People can do anything and any, any uh, active they want to either show off their body or to dance provocatively or to drink. This all becomes part of the revelry for the day in Canada. Um, I took this picture a few years ago and it, it really was an interesting photo because here you have um, uh, two women doing something that I think a lot of Caribbean people like to do on this particular day. That is to sort of thumb their nose at the Toronto police. The Toronto police have had a history in Canada of being very much belligerent towards the black population. And that is, uh, we have shootings in Toronto that have taken place in the past. We have harassment. We have racial profiling that goes on in Toronto since the time my family moved to Canada in 1968. That has been a trend. Uh, the police have gotten a lot better. And I, let me not um, um, totally discolor them. But at the same time, there are incidences where uh, the police aren't considered as a trustworthy uh, entity, institution for people of color in Toronto. So why this picture is important? 
here you have two women deciding that a parked police car on the parade route became their object of um, essentially um, uh, 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 to uh, whine on. And this become this became uh, very provocative, whining on the on the car again as a sort of um, uh, thumbing their nose at the police. But at the same time, it sort of also suggested to me the ways in which these women were also saying to the police for that day, hey, you know what? We control the road. You don't anymore. You're not in the car. But at the same time, the car itself represents for us a, a form of authority. Um, these pictures here clearly show, once again, that women's agency is there around what they consider as beautiful versus what the Canadian aesthetic is of a white woman who clearly would not wear a costume like this unless she had a certain aesthetic that was, uh, again, seen by our by the Dominican culture as being um, ideal. These women clearly uh, are showing you that they are proud of their bodies, that they are um, they, they've spent a lot of money on these costumes. And for the day, they're not going to worry about uh, what other people think of them because they are proud of being um, black women on the streets. Similarly, you see the same trend around, I, I refer to these as mixed women. These are women who have various mixtures and they're doing the same thing in terms of having fun on the road and also um, showing that they belong, they're in charge of that road and that they essentially don't necessarily have the idealized Canadian body type, but they are certainly going to flaunt it and um, be in charge of their circumstance. So I've reached the time for conclusions, and I'll end the presentation uh, after I make my conclusions, and then we'll go on to uh, Yolanda Richardson. So to me then, participating in the annual parade every year allows Caribbean immigrants to feel a sense that they occupy a potential space that they can get a, a, a reprieve from the pervasive racism in Canada and the feelings of alienation. So Caribbean women in particular um, today follow Destra's call to emancipate themselves from things like slut shaming and feeling about being indecent in a costume and essentially celebrating themselves. So to be in a costume on Caravana Day then for women, this becomes the time of the year where they can flourish they're elevated, their status is the highest it can get. They are desirable. They're admired for their skin color, their curves, their blemishes, their scars, their age markers. All of those are normally hidden behind clothing, but now are exposed and uh, not being ashamed of. And so the, although the summer festival in Toronto is just one day of the year, there's clearly a disruption of the white supremacy culture in Canadian society. The parade allows Black women to have a sense of optimism for the future and their children. And the lakeshore space, which is that road, is temporarily transformed into what we refer to as a potential space that they can have a sense of belonging, a sense of mattering, a sense of um, they are desirable, which is, again, something that Black women and women of color in general in white spaces don't actually get to experience that 364 days of the year. So for the one year, one day of the year, uh, Black Caribbean people and Caribbean people in general matter in Canada. They have an optimistic sense of uh, the manifestation of being uh, a woman of color, feeling a sense of agency, a sense of self-efficacy. So whining, dancing, prancing, provocatively expressing themselves in the streets in Toronto ultimately gives Caribbean origin, both men and women, a temporarily feeling of object loss and cultural mourning. So here's where I'll end by just showing you a uh, book that uh, I helped to co-author with my colleague, uh, Dr. Francis Henry. And the book is actually available on Amazon. And the book title is Carnival is Woman, Feminism and Performance in the Caribbean Mass. It's available uh, as we speak now. I appreciate uh, if you would uh, be interested in getting the book. And I'll now turn it back over to um, Deborah and um, uh, Yolanda Richardson. And if, in case you want to contact me, Here's my contact information. It's uh, Professor Dwayne Plaza, Oregon State University, School of Public Policy. You can Google that, or you can just copy down my email address, dplaza at orst.edu. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your attention. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Dwayne. I know that you can't see everyone in the room, but they were all clapping. 
Um, I don't know if you have any urgency in leaving because I'm sure there will be some questions or would you like to answer some questions now? I will wait till after um, Yolanda's finished and we can do a, a round robin of questions. So thank you very much in the room, everyone in the room. I appreciate your attention and the opportunity, Deborah, for presenting tonight. Thank you. So that was very interesting part. I was amazed and I found it nice to see that not only here we think of the policemen that we can um, whine on in some way or another, uh, because I think indeed most of us, uh, when they're walking by, are wondering. But now we go over to the panel discussion um, and a short introduction by our senior lecturer of, at the Faculty of Arts and Science, Yolanda Richardson. Um, after that, she will, we will have our panelists come up and discuss. That way, Dwayne can also see you and um, we can all interact. So Yolanda, it's uh, over to you. Let me just... Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you're not wondering why we are doing this in English. I guess you figure it out. Before I send a papiamento, but then we will exclude doing. So I prepared my presentation, which is a segue before the panel for us to give, for us to get a view of a uh, or get a local perspective on what we just talked about before we do the panel. So I um, so I thought when they asked me to be a moderator, um, I thought, okay, how would I do this? How would I give this team a local perspective? I show you here the material that I use to prepare. I think and hope everybody know these books. And unfortunately, I only had the last published Bacchanal, but I've been to Chibi van der Hans, for those who are Bacchanalists in Aruba. I hope you know that he made um, collecting data on Aruba Carnival, his life work. Unfortunately, he's still battling the financial issue to publish. Um, he already has two volumes only from 2004 to 2008. And he had to take down his um, website with all the information. So I had to go to him to get some information, but there is some hope that soon we will get, it, get the publication sponsored. So I thought I would think about some statements for, um, to encourage the discussion. I will tell you my approach in a while, and then I'll introduce the panel members who are here already to join me at the table here. So the statements. Um, I looked at feminism as the approach for tonight. And um, briefly, feminism is an overarching concept that challenges the subordination of women, it advocates for equality of sexes aimed at empowering women and igniting female agency. It's also a movement. Often when we think of feminism, we think of women not liking men or angry women. In my case, they would say an angry black woman. But I mean, it's, there's some truth to that, but it's more um, trying to understand um, issues of inequality in communities. Velox defines feminism simply as Feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. You see the themes recurring oppression, subordination, and sexism. Influenced by the work of Bakhtin, carnival is considered a bodily gesture of emancipation. So carnival has that aspect of being emancipatory also. And then I thought, um, let's look at Calypso performances, carnival pieces, and I will make those my recurring themes tonight for us to discuss or to ignite the discussion or the dialogue. And I see those as a, the a theatrical platform. Dwayne spoke about the road and that being the environment or the place where you are able to um, display whatever um, theatrical element you want to display. And I thought that I see, together with other feminists and others who write about Carnival, I see Carnival as a site for resistance and critique. And definitely all of us who go to Calypso Contest, 
We always say it's for critica. It is also said that Carnival challenges social and political structures, and we spoke about that a lot. And finally, I thought I won't, and you're going to see why in a while. I think that the Queen election perpetuates traditional gender roles, the subordination of women, the one dimensional beauty standard derived from colonialism or ethnocentrism. So I went thinking after preparing these statements, I went thinking, how would I can do, make the connection? And because of time, and we really want to talk to our panelists and get you involved, I'm only going to look at local Queen elections briefly. And I'm going to look at um, some female Calypso participants. I'm going to look at or show you how I find they use their body for agency and what themes they usually address since it's about critique and resistance. And time in the sea, in the end, um, because of time, I might go faster. So we started here. I think everybody recognized this. And it was um, maintenance, I would say, of a European beauty standard practice, Victorian in all sense of the word. I know people say they had to do this at the most. They were not even allowed to dance. They had to back up on a stage, somebody told me once. And this is the first queen of St. Nicholas. And you will think St. Nicholas is alternative always. But here you see that Miss Pamela Brown who um, passed away some years ago, also dressed in white. You see the hierarchical elements. If you're the queen of the carnival, you are the highest on the floats. This is 1973. And um, Chibi has a lot of information, but we don't know who this is. At least I don't know. I was not able to talk to him about that because I just told I just said, give me some pictures, give me some pictures. This is my idea. So, um, and then came a school, secondary school in Aruba. At that time, it was the most important secondary school on the island for a stream um, educational programs. Um, and um, together with an artist, the one who designed our previous um, currency, our previous bills, Evelino Fingal. They designed the clothing for another girl from St. Nicholas who became um, the youth queen at that time. And here started the idea of we are not going to perform and show ourselves only in those white costumes. You see ethnicity also played a role here. Very interesting with um, Sam Alec who then um, decided that she would also go in a, in a non-white costume. So in 1984, after the first election, was in 1955, so it took us almost 30 years to get here. Almost 30 years to get here. In between, um, and this is in... I'm showing you that I think this lady was very brave. I have no idea who it is. But I see her trying to make a difference. I see her trying to um, have agency of who she are, who we are as a community, and what carnival means for us. And then I just want to show you that while Miss Brown dressed in white in 1973, 1974, when she passed her crown to Miss Giselle Cruz, she wore red. And I asked Chibi, I want the original picture because when his book comes, comes out, you will not notice it because it's in black and white, but you would see it different because it would be darker than the other. But I told him, <clears throat> if that's black in your black and white picture, it must have been colored. So I think that um, even though maybe she was forced to conform to the norms then. I think she was sending a message. She tried, right? I find it very brief. So 
And then I just wanted to talk to you about Miss Marjorie Fleming, who in 1988 uh, dared coming on stage with more than just a white dress. So I think this probably started the age of costumes during carnival also. And those who live on the island know that there was disqualification for what have you and what other not. But um, I think for tonight, it's very interesting to see the lady in green, but also to see that she's being rebellious, to say the least. Then I'm going to go fast to Calypso contest, bodily gestures and emancipatory movements and agency. If you are a frequent attendant to Calypso contest, you will know that in 1981, <coughs> Ras Linda, one as the first female, she won the World March Contest. And then I was a bit disappointed when I saw her in 2014. I thought to myself, where are the locks? Is it confirmation? Is it, is it, has she become conformist? I don't know. But I think sometimes when you are in a battle as a female, it can be a lonely <coughs> road. So I didn't ask her, I didn't do research like doing there on the topic, but I thought to myself, as I said a while ago, to ignite the discussion, I thought, let me show you this. So the stage name is Ras Linda, but she's not a Rasta. Or she is or not? She was. She was. She's not anymore. I would I thought, I thought. You know, it could be a lonely road when you are rebellious. That is what I thought. But we'll discuss it. Then I go to another um, road march queen. And we looked at the pictures, Chibi and I, and we thought, hmm, owning her body, you will think, Dwayne said that um, some of the women know, don't mind the size, don't mind the clothing. They just own their bodies. And I thought, I think Miss um, Inky Richardson is trying that also. I see her struggling sometimes. Maybe it's the theme of her song that, that um, directs her clothing. Um, and if it is the theme of her song that directs her clothing, then I think that we are, that improvement that we made from the 1955, um, Queen election, maybe we're still in that same process. I have no idea. I thought I'll just touch some of these things with you. And then thinking on bodily gestures, I found this picture. I'm assuming you know this is Lady V. She was also a queen. I believe she was a Calypso queen. Um, and uh, I liked this, Lady V. Anybody could imagine what I thought of the V when I think of agency? Anybody? Yes. Yes. I think victory. So she's Lady V, but I, I never realized it until I went to prepare for this. That the V could be for victory, right? Could be other things too. Could be other things too. <laughs> could be other things too. But owning her body also. Um, and I don't know if you know, she's a teacher. She's in the space of teaching. So I could imagine that people would question her often about how she displayed herself during carnival. But she's been very consistent and she owns her own, um, and I think that's interesting. You see her here in some, probably some people will question this. And then I'm going to go to the youngsters, I'm running with the thing. And I think they dare more than some of the older um, Calypsonians, they started early. So maybe we have been saying messages that it is okay. You can own your body. You can be emancipatory in the way you express yourself as a female. So I'm giving you some time to look at this. 
because I thought when you see this, you go to it. Oh. So realize that this is the same person. And, and when preparing, I thought to myself, when I see her on stage, I often say, you go, girl. And um, I imagine that this will be theme for contestation, you know, that we still have that moral knob in our brains. But can we do this? Can we not do this? And um, interestingly, I find that, um, I find it nice. I find it breaking with barriers. And if you say feminism is about you know, dealing with sexist ideas, I think this is an, an initiation of breaking barriers for female. And this is, I believe, almost one of my last. And this is the same youngster here. <clears throat> I guess you realize that. The stage name is Mezzo. Something happened. Yes. Also, I think the younger generation does not conform to the norms that society puts for them. And um, like Duane said, the change globally, youngsters, they dare more, they go out for what they are, who they are. They are, they are unapologetic about themselves, about their bodies, about their choices. And I think that um, we will be seeing this type of, these type of costumes even more as the youngsters take over the stage, because it's also, it has something to do with resistance also. Then I just want to look at the terms. Um, remember I said that in Calypso, you see through the themes that are discussed or presented on a stage, you also see that contestation and the critique Within, in, within the community. And I think there's no time to read this, um, unfortunately. Well, um, this is about emancipation and um, discrimination in Aruba. Sometimes we think that, um, last time somebody told me, Aruba is not a discriminator, we don't discriminate in Aruba. But anyway, this says, my white girlfriend tell me once, I don't like man when they hear hard. When they hear her, I watch she go and I'm funny because I know then she can like me because my hair hard from top to the bottom and all under my belly. So I tell she nice and friendly, them is the man who could satisfy me. Well, time went by and spit fell out the sky. To my big surprise, my white girlfriend find a good black man now she bragging about the size. <laughs> so it has that aspect of emancipation, but also identifying discriminatory practices. Some feminist uh, tones. And I thought I would want to share this with you. So sometimes people tell me, I'm not a pobre de Kiko, not a canto, or not a canto inglés. So you see that the information is very, is very valuable if we want to know what is going on in the community. And then briefly, I just want to show you that female often um, have look at themes um, in the community um, that we need to discuss. Oh, I forgot to mention that um, Miss um, Singing J had a song about child abuse. Um, when she sang that song, she did not, she won with this one, this so fast. On the song of child abuse, she only placed fourth. I don't know, maybe the person who won, I was not able to check it out. But she says, when she spoke to, to Chibi, she said that um, the reaction in the community by female, because one of the themes or one of the sentences was that she found that women need to be more particular of their children when it comes to child abuse that there is some responsibility also for your child. And she said that she got some backlash in the community on that song. So interesting how women ourselves 
how while we may be feminist on one team, we are very conservative on another team. Here you see, I just want to identify teams that Queen Sasha talked about or sang about, Strictly Rob, also Anna called it on, apologetic, Me on You, also very unapologetic according to me. Why your pants got ripped. Okay, so women being feminists and trying to deal with the inequalities that we are often or that we often encounter. And here I also had some sweetness. Time, which is interesting for us to discuss. Just sharing the teams with you. So I will read them. And then I would stop here with Konga Jam. And then I wondered, I thought to myself, why Konga Jam? Why would we trace back in an emancipatory process? But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't I don't have the lyrics. So it's interesting if we would have a platform, like I said a while ago, where we could have this material because then we could do research, for instance, on all these themes. But the Conga Jam is to me, it took me back in time. And I thought, hmm, when preparing here today, but I'll ask the question in mind. And then I wanted to present one of our panelists. <laughs> and for one, I respect this panelist who will be joining us in a while for her courage to identify or to tackle ethnic issues or identity issues on that platform, on that stage. If you look at her clothing, when she performs, it always has a message, always has a message. That is not even talking about her songs. And one of them I tried to share lyrics with you today and when you see the dot, dot, dots, I didn't understand what was said myself, <laughs> but we'll hear that later on tonight. The song is Together We Stand. It says, I am a woman and I am a mother and I can see things like any other. The youth of today is going astray. You got girls over there and boys over so with the pants low, low. Someone tell me where we're we going today. Education starts at home with values, morals, and goals. It's a fact. It takes a village to raise a child. Neighbors have a role, law enforcement too. So why you think it don't apply to you? As a community, we are all responsible because together we stand and divide it before. You must understand it takes one and all because together we stand and divide it before. You must understand it takes one and all. I think this is the best example of using a platform to address social, economic, and political issues. And that was it for my presentation. And I want to invite... So while they take a seat, I know they don't need no introduction. The Bora. I sure can. I can see everyone right perfectly. Thank you very much. So why we do the so you all see we yeah we do everything here at the university. So in the center we have the minister Xiomara Maduro. I does not need any introduction, but it says here, and I think 
that she did her bachelor's degree in economics at the Han University of Applied Sciences in Nijmegen. Then she obtained her master's degree in law at the University of Groningen. She's currently a minister of finance, but today I would say she's a minister of culture. You no know more to talk finance. <laughs> in Canada, in that inversion, everybody happy, everybody free, everybody rich. <laughs> right? And she's also a carnivalist, and she joins Majestic and Lost Life. And oh, the border, you move the picture. Sorry. While the border goes back to my PowerPoint, I want to show you. And then I'll continue with Queenie Anne. Okay. Yeah. Queenie Anne is the group leader of the Empire Carnival Group. And according to me, this is their seventh year that they're participating in right. Carnival. They celebrated their fifth anniversary. And um, we are, Queenie is the manager at Elite Productions. She's co-founder of the Wow of Aruba and also <coughs> manager at Piso Tris Managing Company. Yes. And then you have know, Celeste Woodley close to me, to my right, your left. Celeste is a poet. And I guess you know she's a songwriter after what I, <laughs> I recited a while ago. She's co-founder of We Culture. She's owner of Square Garden Upholstery, founder of Imperial Designs. She's also a carnivalist, bacchanalist, and she's the daughter of one of the biggest carnival pioneers, Mr. Woody. And then we have the pictures here. I'll start immediately with the questions. So we, they got my teams, right? You got my teams. So you know it's going to be those um, My first question is, is Aruba Carnival conducive to empowerment of women? Think that Aruba's carnival is conducive to the empowerment of women. Yeah. Yes, we have in carnival we have no order. I was going to say I was going to say your marriage. You know. Okay, we go in the carnival in version or no? Now, good evening. On that subject, um, women, if we see back in the carnival uh, in Aruba, I can, as soon as I have my numbers, I'm completely happy for it. And as soon as I have my numbers of carnival, there was this great lady um, that was a carnivalist. And she was the one, Sylvia Lauritz, um, and she was the one, you know, with the costumes, and she had the children play because, you know, at that time, that is what you want to be seeing children. Okay? And I can remember she was such a force and such an inspiration for so many people. So my first memory of Carnival is a woman that was the one, um, you know, in the forefront. In the forefront. And then, of course, um, you have seen uh, Yak Sak sitting at uh, the Arabasa Carnival. Milo Cruz was first, it was a man. But again, into my, my memories, um, it was Tilia who was the one in charge of Carnival. And when you and I, when I began participating also in Carnival, there were all, uh, no, not all, but <coughs> A lot of those carnival groups were led by women here in Aruba. So I must say, in uh, for the part of organizations, but also for inspiration in Aruba, uh, women have had a very central, uh, state central role. So I think in case of empowerment, I think that power was led by in carnival. That power was ignited. And, and kept strong um, by women because of today we still, we still have uh, women in leading roles in carnival. So that's my opinion on the empowerment of, of women. They have been there as long as I can remember and still having that, uh, that, that part into the, the carnival parade itself, preparing. And uh, then also present in all the other uh, uh, events, so song, 
uh, writing songs also. So, great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, again, thank you also for the presentation. I agree because I'm a, a female group leader myself. Um, I've seen a lot of um, female group leaders, section leaders. I think the only part that is not that much is in the music. You see more men than that work. But I do agree with saying, I do feel it is like I don't feel there's critics about women being head of section or group leader. I, me myself, I don't feel that at all. So let's. Um, from my point of view, um, being that my father is the one who started me into this, um, I see the male aspect more. Um, however, there is the female aspect as well because my mother would be the one to guide and say, you know what, do this, do that, do that, or um, maybe you should try this, you should try that. So it goes both ways. Yeah, <laughs> but you see, but you see, women, but you see that the carnival is a, as an outlet for women to work on more equal rights, to move away from oppressive behavior. It's, it's a like a freedom, like, as a platform yeah, for freedom. Yeah, correct. It's like Dr. Dr. Uh, said. Like when you're on the streets, when you're on the road, it feels it's like your freedom. You don't dress like that. You don't post pictures like that in your normal life. But it's like that's the only moment. Just like Halloween, I feel those are the two <laughs> moments that people can go crazy and you're not being judged or you don't care because it's like you don't the care. feeling of freedom. Yeah. This is free. yeah, yeah. It's freedom. I can do this. I'm not going to go alone. Okay. Then I was wondering. Because we saw those pictures, um, and um, I see that uh, carnival revelers are choosing. For one, I need to say we wear more clothing than what we saw. <laughs> right? Yeah. However, for now, for now, <laughs> because that there comes time. However, but over the years, women are challenging the local norm, particularly youngsters, as I showed you. In, with my pictures. So, um, but I see that these revealing costumes are often you know, the discussion of the midday radio between two and five. I don't know how it is. And it's not radio anymore because it's all televised. Everybody, I think, you know, won't talk about it. <laughs> so, um, and um, feminists see, though, see Carnival as uh, the body gesture, like you say, I don't care, it's emancipatory. Would you agree that we are emancipatory by when we decide that we would put ourselves out there with skimpy clothing? So that's the emancipatory. Um, I would say, easy thing is, you have, that's why you have sections, where you have the, um, I want a more revealing section, and you have less revealing till fully clothing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's up to the person, the individual, which section they choose to wear. Um, as it being emancipatory, it's a feeling. Emancipatory is a feeling. So if you feel that revealing makes you free, by all means, yeah. <laughs> I think that's true. Um, it, you have to be comfortable. It's a party. You're going to a party, you're going to show off. And it is up to you. What are you going to show? Are you going to show your fantasy? Are you going to show your body? And um, so it's, it's, it's very different. And the carnival is about uh, getting loose, as Nesta was saying. Mm -hmm. But then, um, how loose will you go? What do you want? It, what do you want? Because people won't judge, but um, every action gets a reaction. And also it is, what do you want to be getting as a reaction? You want people to see, wow, there is something very beautiful. See, she did a, a nice thing with the clothes or, you know, with a hat piece and that is nice. Or you want them to be seen, oh, I saw her, you know, naked. And I didn't see her or that, or that short. So 
it is more about the individual. What do you want to reveal? What do you? How do you want the people to perceive you? And um, so it, it is it is it is up to you to do that. Where are you feeling comfortable? Because I think people go to carnival because you want to have fun in the first place, and in the second, I think the most important, you want to be comfortable in your own skin. But it is up to you how much will you reveal to another one because not everyone likes to be revealing and that is what Celeste was saying you know that's why you have these sections so everyone seeing what they want to hear and feel comfortable with it. So I think the same I think it's both it's the feeling you have but I think it's also about showing up because you are feeling you have your makeup on it's also what <laughs> Dr. B said at that moment, you have something to where you're feeling beautiful on your robe. So I do feel it has a lot to do with yes, um, you know, beautiful. Yes. Feeling that empowerment, even though if you're going less dressed or not, but it's a mix of the feeling and the perception of carnival that we're going to show off. Once you're participating, a majority of the people will want to show off, even if it's makeup, if it's less dressed, if it's more decorated. I do feel it gives you that power, that feeling. Um, and also nowadays it's a little bit different because you have to be that and to be able our Rubens, even our Rubens are looking at that as an example. And it's a lot sexier, it's a lot more bold because they, they see or Brazil. Yes, or Brazil, they feel like if you how do you say that if you do that, you're being bold because you don't care what people think. So they see that That's also as the same feeling as the same thing. Um do you think carnival mitigates inequalities, if at all? And I think now inequalities, I said, we have the whole discussion of groups. You just mentioned, Celeste just mentioned the different sections. We have a big mass, but you know, if it's, it maintains the status quo in the community. Our class division. This year we don't have a children carnival group in some place. Do you think that carnival mitigates or has the <coughs> power to mitigate inequalities? It, it has the power to do that. Mm -hmm. If everyone can, that if everyone that wants to participate can participate. But as we see in an in an ongoing. Um, Role that is getting, uh, you know, money. And when you go to participate, you know, you want to be going beautifully. And you want, you know, more stones, rhinestones here, a, a nice thing, but all these things cost. And then at some time, you know, uh, you will not be participating. I, I, I can tell this from myself as a child. I always wanted to go into carnival. I, I don't know why I just liked it. And Sylvia Lawrence has a group and so forth, but I know my my, my parents didn't have the money you know, to go with pieces or to even go into carnival. So I was so glad when school decided that we we're going in carnival in North. Oh, I was happy with that. I, just, I still can remember what we had. We just had a blouse and we self made it with paillettes, you know, to do the sequence. There was a sequence and this was dominoes. I can still remember. And the rain came and everything came out. <laughs> but I danced the whole party. <laughs> so I can't remember that was me getting this chance to go into carnival. And sometimes, and I, I confess this year in particular, when I was thinking, you know, the discussions at the radio, when you open the radio at 2 o'clock, and then people begin, yes, now they're charging for this. They're charging the school for this. Uh, people have, to, the, the kids have to be selling 50 tickets because, before they get on, on the um, stage. And I got that feeling that I got, and that, that I wanted to go into the parade, but I knew that my parents didn't have the money for that, but I 
I just wanted to participate and go into a parade. I didn't need it and you know a lot of things and we didn't have a lot of things but oh I had fun. So that is what I was thinking about. It. So um, we have to to come to a, a formula, I think all this that makes it for everyone, giving everyone the chance to participate, you know, by their own means. So it doesn't have to be beautiful, 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 but it has to be beautiful uh, for everyone to participate. So that is what I say about um, the carnival is open to everyone, a short in Aruba, but we have to procure that it stays that in a world that is getting by the day very costly and carnival is costly because you want to go beautiful and you know every rhinestone has its cost for me. In my opinion is um, growing up we always used to go as symbol because there's beauty in mass and if you look at um, Trinidad they had, they used to call it like a sailor's mask. People just dress as sailors. The more, the more beautiful it looked. It's just the mass of it. And these were large roots. And you see powder, you see, and powder was not only for two weeks. <coughs> powder was in carnival as well. And the, the largeness of it is what made it so beautiful. So the symbol clothing for a group of children or a group of adults. It doesn't, it's now we have the stones, the running stones, the palliettes, the, the, the um, theater, and the, um, the, the speaker chest, all of that. You have, you have all of that now, and um, it's taking away of the freedom and the fun that children are supposed to express. And feed on the road. We feed that possibility yes. to, to, to um, move away from inequality. It's true. Girl. I don't think it's fun, but I think it's the people who do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say no, because Carnival does not do that. But yeah, the community does by staying silent, makes it be like that, being, allowing it to be okay, allowing the vision, allowing all that. You know, if I can, I can't. It's we that can change that and say no. That's why it's important, I think, to have the schools participate if you have the budget or not, because it is important. It's part, part of our culture, the tradition, like the stones, they became tradition, but they can also change. Like we're focusing on going a little green as a group because we focus on being an active, but for me, I want to change stuff like that so we can have more people because, just like you said, the mass is like that's what makes it beautiful. You have groups that focus only on being very, uh, I want to say that, eloquent. Like for us, sure it's ambience. We want group on being, like that's what we focus on, having fun. It doesn't have to be so strict with the rules, so, but that's why we cannot never get any breaks. But we choose that. We choose to focus elsewhere. It's a choice. I don't know if Dwayne, yeah. would you like to react on anything that was said here? These three questions. Uh, Sure, I'd like to just say that social class really is played out in Trinidad Carnival and also in Can uh, Toronto Carnival in the costumes that people are able to afford, um, a section leader versus a special section versus a masquerader. So it oftentimes becomes a uh, exclusive um, group that can actually play on the road because you need to have a costume to get on the road during Carabana. You can't just be um, a person from the side jumping in because they have those barriers however by the time you get down to the very end of the parade that's when the other people just sort of jump in they break the barriers they 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 get in and you can't stop them at that point <laughs> but initially when the bands go for judging uh in the inside this little stadium um it's only the masqueraders that are allowed in there yeah so i definitely agree and i also agree with uh, the folks uh, sentiments around uh, gender and representation on on the road clearly the, uh, the younger generation has uh, role models that go beyond just carnival, also into hip hop and rap music. For example, you've got Cardi B, you've got uh, Megan Thee Stallion, you've got Nicki Minaj. All those people get up on the stage and a world stage and use their 
body as something they're very proud of. They're not trying to hide it. They're not falling into those uh, tropes that suggest uh, the sort of biblical tropes around women um, having to worry about um, the, you know, labels. Um, I mean, think about how many decades uh, that we've all lived where the kinds of words that are used against women to police them into feeling less about themselves is still very much there. You know, um, the various negative words we can use. And so that is the reality of young girls growing up. And I think that what I'm seeing as a trend among this current generation, let's call them fifth wave feminists, these are women who are saying, you know what, you can call me whatever you want to call me. I don't really care like what Destra's saying. Um, I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to not worry about the slut shaming you can put, up, put on me. I'm going to dance provocatively and you deal with it. I don't have to deal with that. So I think we're all on the same page and I really appreciate the panel and I appreciate um, their perspective. Deborah, can I ask one last question? Yes, I showed you the, the, the movies from the Carnival Queen. We talked about the sequence and the thing that extends the whole discussion in the community about the Queen election. So I was wondering, how do you see the Queen election? I wrote that it perpetuates the classical role of women and subordination and one dimensional beauty standards, that beauty concept and the thinness. You know? So it's a bit, for me, it's a bit, I thought it was a bit, it's a, it's a contradiction. You in carnival where everything should be free. <coughs> uh, it's an instrument to destabilize structures. But then when you go on stage, we have this, and sometimes goes a little girl told me, that other girl that Kibra won't be in the stage. <laughs> you know, what's happening? So my question is, do these elections, should we abandon these elections if we want to narrow the gender gap for little girls? Sorry, can you repeat this? So should we abandon the Queen election as is for us to narrow, support the narrowing of the gender gap? Yeah. I would say that I find that Personally, I'm a little lesbian. I do see the, the how it changed, how it evolved from being white, being now I don't feel like you have to be thin. It's supposed to be fun. I don't believe in the last year it was about you. It was more about being a carnivalist, being comfortable in your showcasing you can dance because it's not like a dream speech. It's um, showcasing you can send a message. So I think it's evolving, it should evolve more in that direction. For inclusion for everybody and not that it doesn't have to feel or be that you have to be a certain type of person to win and again for me that's us that can decide and change that and tell us and say no we've seen it, 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 it how do you say that it changed a lot because at the beginning you had like 30 now you have like three it's calling for like help <laughs> There's a reason for revolution it's because it's funny, it's expensive, but then again, you, you, you want to have fun when you're going all over social media about your child, you don't want that. It's like it's, a, it's it's traumatizing. So we really have to change that. Again, I think it's on us to do that, but I find it extreme to, to eliminate it. Me. Okay. Well, I would say it has changed over the years, that's true. Um the best, or not the best, the um, one I would more than lean towards is Senora Carnaval because that one has more of be who you are and it's a, yeah, it's more fun, it's more um, Carnavales, it's more, um, they get a chance because, yes, it's not so, it gets not better than that, but it's more of bring what you are. Yeah. Bring what you are to the table, and let's see who has who does it the best. Instead of um, um, the show, the, the speech, speech yeah. The, yeah, versus all of that. Vanessa, the the elections right now is about the show. So it's the show and the message that they can create. It's not all about uh, the beauty. 
This first it was, you know, everyone was in white, so everyone was equal. There is no much sense of creativity than at that time the speech and the way they could give a message in three in, in three or four languages. It was, but then things evolved and changed. And um, and to see okay, what will be the extravaganza with it? And I can remember at that time with uh, Marjorie Fleming, and she came with an um, she came from out of the stadium. I can remember, so that was one point of discussion I can remember. And then she brought dancers. I think she had was brought professional dancers from the American Hotel. I thought it, it was. So that was another point of discussion. And she came not only with a dress, but she came with a body piece. Ooh, another point of discussion because those were evolving. And when you see that over years, you see that the, the people wanted to see the show. People wanted to hear her message. People wanted to see her deliver the speech. And right now, people want to see if these candidates can do something special. If they can, um, you know, if they can dance, if they can sing, a lot of them sing. So if she is Tarnava, if she can represent Tarnava, um, I agree that as Tarnava itself is getting very expensive, and I know, you know, um, at school when one gets uh, gets to be queen or something, and, and they say, um, and is she going to stadium? <laughs> so to participate in the real election, they say, no, that's too much, too much. So it is, um, but what I find very great is that it is not only now the, the queen itself, but everything that her creativity comes with it. I see a lot of creativity in at on the stage, and I think that is very beautiful. So I think it's not about that, you know, who is more than the other one, but it is that you can see how creative people are getting also in giving a good um, message, a message that has content. Real content that can help, um, um, you know, uh, people in a room addressing something. <coughs> so that is what I find very beautiful at, at those uh, elections. I very much like to go um, on, on to this election just to, to see and to dream and to see them on stage. So it, it has a, a very vi vibrant and positive thing with it. Um, I wonder if I could add to that um, what Minister Maduro just said, because I think it's also very important what you also said, uh, Yolanda, around the white outfit that the carnival queens were wearing. And I think that's also a very symbolic color, right? I mean, a color of virginity, a color of purity, a color of not being married, because I think probably one of the character, one of the criteria of being carnival queen is you, you had to be single. Because that's a, a sort of typical um, queen-like um, criteria across the world, and so just if we even think about the whole idea of beauty contests, we don't have beauty contests for men. We never have, and and uh, those contests pit women against each other, um, and it pits them in the sense that if you follow the gender norms or conventions of ideal beauty for your culture whatever your culture is. And of course, we have the sort of a white supremacist culture that sort of overlies all of this. And so when I looked at all your images you produced, um, uh, Yolanda, those were also uh, images of women who had European features, the long straight hair, um, the sort of skin color uh, wasn't necessarily white, but it was very light skin colors. And those became the women actually then that got elevated to be noticed, to be the beauty queen in your culture and also Trinidadian culture. And so uh, dark-skinned women were not welcome in those competitions uh, in Trinidad and likely in Aruba, the same thing. And so I also want us to think about the ways in which those ideals still very much permeate the DNA of our own thinking process. So although we'd like to think those ideals are there yesterday, you know, we've got over that. I hate to tell, I hate to think about it, but they still are very much 
socialized. It's locked into our own unconscious value system. When we see people, we start to still have those criteria to determine who is beautiful and who is not. So if you're a in trend and if you're still a dark skinned woman, you're still not necessarily considered as attractive. But on Carnival Day, man, you can you can be who you want to be. Anyway, I'll stop with that. I want to thank the panelists for questions. I'll bring it back over to Deborah. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you for being the moderator, um, seeing the time. I would like, if anyone had any questions, I see people like, yes, they have questions. But I think um, it would be wise for those who have questions maybe to come forward. Also for the speaker, because Dwayne is online and I'm not sure of the sound. I'm not sure if the snowball will be able to capture. But maybe we can start with the first question and see, Dwayne, if you can hear what they're asking. I, I can hear perfectly. Yeah, but they're all sitting on the back. So let me start with the first question. Who Maybe wants... you can repeat the questions. If yeah. you can repeat the question, that'd be that'd work. If I'm, if I'm good at that, yeah. <laughs> Something sunny. Sorry, let's see. If it's a short question. If not, you have to come in the front. <laughs> well, I'm loud enough, so I think uh, you can should you... be able to hear. Yes, can you... I can hear. Yes. Okay. All right. Good seeing you again, by the way. Oh, uh, thank you very much. It's a two-part question and you look at it as uh, thinking about it from the powers that be a group leader and a minister of culture so the minister spoke about as being a youngster and the first time with Miss Lawrence and being able to get out there and sit the t-shirt a little bit mess it up <laughs> just the mere fact of the freedom of carnival and at the end of the day, when the group leaders make a recommendation, I assume it comes to the others. And one of the things that I, would, I don't think I would ever agree with is the fact that we have a small group. I don't know how many are there in terms of group of only, maybe five or six. Yeah, it's somewhere in that area. Exactly. Determine how carnival or how can you participate in carnival. For instance, if it doesn't go the uh, path of well, you can't participate in anything else. So if you go, you have to participate in all. I could be wrong. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't go like that. It's like okay. the rules we have for a long time because mm -hmm. a lot of rules, like you know, when we go to meetings, that's why you have like now the smart. Okay. So the group only came like now, and it's really not. I, mean, I don't want to talk about it. It's really not consistent. You cannot really make those changes. It's not really like that. So my question being, I think those are rules that need to be revised in order for us to have uh, instead of exclusion of no participation for groups, which is uh, one of our most simple. And not just for the kids, but also for the grown-ups. If they choose to go like that, it's supposed to be for the entire community. That's my uh, You have that choice. Again, it's just like for my group, we don't follow the... the when you say, for me, it's not rules, it's the points for you to win. But for us, it doesn't make sense because we want to have fun, so we're not going strictly with only two types of costumes because we'll decide that. But I think we uh, kind of miss each other on the way there. The point being that if you don't comply with one, you cannot participate in the other. Is that a fact or not? That's a fact according to the rules of SMAP uh -huh. and the group winning. But so therefore, I cannot come and just bring up a group and say, I'm only participating in one parade, for instance. Yeah, they do it, like now it just happened. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm a lot of years in the area, yeah, four years exactly, and Mark has been for seven years, you just follow. And now you have more voice because you're the young one, this and that. But what they, they because what just happened, for example, with Doshi, we didn't vote. We didn't say you cannot participate because I, we thought as our group, that's part of engrandeciendo Catapal. So why would we say no? And then three of the group leaders from all times explained to me like you're a rookie because you don't understand that what is happening here is you give them the permission to go for only one parade that is like the fundraising parade because carnival is expensive. Because I'm not gonna lie, to, to put a group on, on the road just for for all your visual, just for all of that, it's like a hundred thousand dollars that you have to pay just to have a song on the road, and you need that. 
Like, what other music you don't have fun with? So they explained to me that if they're going only for one parade, they're gonna be making it difficult for the groups that have to pay all the parades going in daytime because what you get, for example, from the faculty covers what you have in the masa in the daytime because you cannot charge the people for the masa because it would be like 3,000, then you'll have nobody. So that's why you have the fundraising parades, which is Parada de Los and Fakel, that helps a group participate in all of the carnival parades that you can go with the big ones. So if you give them the chance to that everybody's going to just make money out of that and their carnival will stop because nobody wants to put it back in the other parades. That, that's what it makes a little sense, but for me it's still a little <coughs> difficult to judge or just follow. Okay, so that's why I said I'm not going to vote because I cannot follow, I didn't do my research, I don't think it's, and it's a, in this case it was a group that was, has been participating for 15 years, never showed a reason for wanting to boycott Capital or wanting to, you know, just want the money from one parade, it was because of some situation, you always have that gray area. But yeah, it's difficult because it's, like you say, it's a small group, you have those for, for the longest time, and you don't feel you really have that voice. But then again, I feel we're not open and not about it. You have like radio stations, like I'm just gonna say like even and stuff, but it's not enough. It's like a show. It's not really voicing out everybody's agreeing this has to stop. Everybody thinks about it, but they don't really do anything about it. You know what I mean? I feel it's, it, it's in the actions. It's not just posting. Posting for me, that's okay. It's, it's starting something, but it's not really doing something about it. So, yes. Yeah, I would like to hear the message you have to add anything to that. For instance, when those kind of recommendations come to your desk. No, they don't come to my desk as such. You must say it, you, you must see it like this. What is the role of the government in the carnival right now? It is um since you have um sack and smack, they ask and they come and they say, you know, there is carnival, we want to organize carnival, we want a special um, license to do that so what do, does the government do okay i give you the license you organize carnival um come conform this uh, according to the rules you have established so that was staff doing her thing then came smack because the carnival groups had a quarrel with the staff they say you know where is the money of the sponsors you're getting you are not getting no help from the staff we want you to open the books. So that was the quarrel at that time. And then the group say, you know, with no groups, you have no carnival to, to, to guide. So if you don't do what I want, we're going to establish our own thing. That happened with SMAC at that time. And at that time, the Minister of Culture was okay with that. So he said, you know, at a time in giving uh, the license, the two apply. Uh, SMAC was given the license. So that was SMAC coming. SMAC, all the groups. All the groups came together. They put on what the rules would be, also for the rules from who was winning what. And so Carnival started. Then what happened is um, uh, two years down, everyone down. SMAC also down. They didn't have fundraising. So the state thing needs to organize, got the license, and now is organizing the carnival. But what we are seeing, what we are seeing right now is SMAC wants to come to um, fundos so that, you know, they, they, they pay a uh, uh, the credit because that was an issue and so forth. So as the Minister of Culture, I'm just looking right now of what is happening into this. Are, are, does SMAC, can SMAC, um, um, you know, lead Carnival, organize the Carnival? Indeed, does he has the power to do that? And you have to take, does the, does the government has to take that at some time, you know, the Department of Culture has to take it over, and you know, and then you just organize, because what is happening right now, the, the groups are concentrated into, into SMAC. They take the decisions, the group takes the decisions, and then they go on the street. But then what is SMAC? It is the groups. So that's why you can see also for the street itself and the parade itself, there is no such guidance. That is why you need also the police 
What does the government do? We cover police expenses, brandware, ambulance, um, you know, selling man, uh, railway, and that cost around 1.5 million euros. So that would be the government, you know, giving assistance uh, to Kali. But it's a good time in which we have to see how things are evolving because everything is money. So you cannot say, you know, SMAC is not trying to be to sustain itself, but it those changes don't go softly. It doesn't go softly. And again, you don't have a lot of people participating where you can make a change or how do you say that? Like for, for SMAC, for a president of SMAC, you don't get anybody that wants that position. So how <laughs> um, will they change something if it's you know, the people that have a voice or has maybe good ideas don't participate where they can have that voice. So if you give me the opportunity to just have one. Uh, yes. Do you think that we need an association to run the, the carnival? Or as this story has shown us, we have two foundations. And as the minister made mention of uh, asking SAC to open the books, which they never did. And I don't know if SMAP was ever approached. <coughs> From that aspect, yes. so we can have more participation. So we, what do you think? Of SMAP, SMAP um, has been giving their annual reports in which they um, they put um, everything, um, how they the money they have gathered and, and everything. So that I must say, SMAP was complying altogether with that. But because SMAP is the groups that the group leaders are someone from the group into there. But you have to see when you organize as a group itself, at that time, it's very difficult to leave what behind in SMAC helping SMAC. And that is why SMAC needs volunteers because it is a big organization as a group to put a group on the street. Ooh, I have very good time for this lady because I know what it is. You know, when you are on the street, everything can happen. Generate a time. You get all those participants on you. Participants drink too much. They come to you. And you know, there are so many things um, happening on Carn Carnival. But I think if um, more of us would like to help, that would be um, a, a good thing. Because you, you, this is not, you know, SMAP doesn't have the money, for instance, to pay people. So it's only volunteers. And everyone needs, you know, um, um, sponsors to get this done. And not everyone gets those sponsors. Or when fundraising, please go help them. Go do uh, it. Yeah, it's them. really not the same as it used to be. Definitely posted. And again, in, like in our group, I think other groups also you have volunteers. So for me, it's really difficult to send someone of my group because I really need them into SMART. So SMART is really trying, but again, it's not a lot of carnivalistas. You don't have like a broad group that can really fully decide. It's really the, those that has the time or knows each other, but they, they try. You cannot take that away, but still, that's why I think yeah. the SMART needs more participation because you have the group leaders and the time we, we meet, it's mostly like they're representing, okay, these are the rules, or if you have to vote for the president, but if you have to show up, and, you know, so it, it's, it's not that easy. And it's, it's easier to, to, to say, you know, it's not going well, but I think it's the people that want the change need to be participating and joining a club, joining a carnival group. So you can really do your research yourself by saying, okay, this is where I think I can help. And this is where the change is needed. So I'm looking at the time and I know Dwayne is online. So I would like to have like two questions. Uh, two questions, I believe. Uh, Ender, you had a question, I think? Yes, I do. Okay. So, um, Dwayne, can you hear? Come in Just front. It's a long question, so okay. they will be coming in the front. <laughs> And you know, are there other questions after this one? Any urgent questions? So that you can come to the front as she finishes. <laughs> okay, good night, everyone. Good night, Good night, Okay, um, my question is as follows for the carnivalistas. 
has it ever been a question or even a discussion? I'm going back to the topic of uh, green election. Uh, I heard Ms. Mrs. Yul uh, Richardson presented it, also uh, Mr. Plaza presented it, but we didn't really touch it. Uh, was it ever a discussion or a question? How can we get more dark-skinned girls participate? Um, we have seen, we know, all of the queens, the majority, are light-skinned, if we can call mm -hmm. it. And also, um, last Monday, GB presented all of his magazine, the covers for him, his magazines, and it was really upfront. Uh, see that all of them were light-skinned uh, colored queens. Uh, no offense to this, of course not, but I just wonder if it was ever a discussion in the group leaders, uh, the different carnival groups uh, that uh, sent a queen to represent them, if they ever wondered how can we change that? Um, mm -hmm. For the past years, we, we noticed that um, there were some girls, <clears throat> sorry, there were some girls that were sent with Down syndrome. That is very beautiful to see. But I wonder mm -hmm. what about the dark skinned girls? Um, why don't they? Or why aren't they pushed more or encouraged more? Um, is this a discussion amongst the the um, the judges? You know, from okay, you know, let's be a bit more diverse. Was it ever a question or discussion? No, not that I took part of because I think they don't even think about it. It's like now I have my um, wall aroma. I'm a co-founder of Women Empowerment Now, and it's because of courses that I follow that you start reading more about inclusion, and then you start like noticing that, for example, it's not about inviting you to participate. It's like really inviting you to sit at a table, and you know, it's all that type of difference that you have to make. So I did it like in my organization, but the majority of the board said to me like. You didn't even think about it because you don't you don't do it with that intention. So you really think everyone is equal, they don't feel like that. So when he spoke today, like a lot of things came back to things that I have followed online, and we're far away, we're far away because I, I took that even at my job. I started noticing that I told you know dark skin people do at, at, at my work. Do we have gays? Do we have this? Do we have that? Now that you know better, you do that. That's what I believe. But for me being part, no, because I haven't been part in any meetings about the Queen Election because we don't stand pins. We, we did have one since 65, other than that, we didn't participate because, again, for us, it's too much to go given that we focus only on the parade. So that's why I can tell you that me as the empire, we have to get. But I'm sure after today, I would not do that because, no, I agree, I agree, and I think. It has to be spoken, it has to be mentioned because people, I really truly believe they don't do that for on purpose. But they have to mention it so people are more aware and so they can start like pushing because maybe they need to push because even you think time evolves, still you, have, you still have that lack of. Yeah, you know? it's not a reflection of the society actually. I, mean, I would say, um, before you had election, queen election in each borough of district. Yeah, each district had its queen election, schools had its queen elections. And from that, like the uh, minister said earlier, um, stadium, from there you see yes. who yes. is going yes. to go yes. to the yes. stadium. Yes. And be, based on that, you would then get different ethnicities, you would get different, you know, because they are different districts. So you have different representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since we don't have that now, because most people say, oh no, Mr. Manda Urena. So basically, they select someone who they want to represent them, and that person is sent. It's not a fair election, and that the winner goes. So it's not the people's choice that goes, it's just someone that's picked. Yeah. I just remember if I can share a bit of my uh, experience. When I was young, uh, we received visitors at home. And I think it was 86, I was about six years old, or seven, 87. And um, my mom was approached to send me for Queen Infantil. And she said, no, not my daughter. 
You know, she won't embarrass herself on the stage. You know, mm -hmm. my mom is someone she used to sew for carnival, etc. So she knows what to do. She has all of these ideas, and she said, "Emma, if you know, I I know you are going to win, but are you going to be chosen?" So that was the first. As a young age, a young girl, hearing that, it already created a barrier. And you grow up and, okay, I will never participate in the queen elections because I won't be chosen. Until when you're older and the kids keep asking, you feel no way for that? 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 And I'm like, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, 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 you keep going. You keep going. Keep going. So the students at school will be saying, you know, um, they want to send me for, for uh, Mrs. Carnival, etc. And I'm like, okay, now, you know, Mrs. Carnival, you're accepted, you know, it's more freer, etc. But no, I don't want to be Mrs. Carnival. I want to be infantile queen. I want to be youth queen. I want to be queen of a reverse carnival. But the, the mentality that you, yeah, how you grow up, you, you're not. And I think the most important thing is yes. that the one who, that goes to participate wants to go to participate. That is, that is I think it's, it's, it's more important than anything else, mm -hmm. you know, because once I think you're on the stage and you want to win, you are going to win. And that is what we have to put in, in people. It's, it's more than um, skin deep that it, that it has to be that freedom comes from not from the skin but from the people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So it's quarter past nine, and I just want to add because Queenie, you said it. Um, uh, social diversity, inclusion, equity, I feel is lacking. Uh, this is my personal opinion, not the. the opinion of the University of Aruba, let's be clear, because at the end of the day, I host, but I'm also um, an individual and a woman, a proud woman to stand in front of it. It's missing. And I look back and I have this conversation with Dr. Um, Gregory Richardson, which is Andrew's husband, by the way, um, on, on faculty. And I believe Gregory joined us online, where I said, when you look at faculty, you know, you began with a um, group where, it's my opinion, um, there was a combination between how the Ruban community is changing. It's a combination of between Rubans and, and Latin Americans that I saw in the first group. And there are groups that are, it's a Nicholas group, you know, um, with not all the lights and not all the torches in the, bin, in the, in the middle of them. They stand out because they disrupt um, as it is. But at the end, the last lap, which is the, used to be the best part of the whole carnival. Now you see, it seems like the um, social class and, and persons have been forgotten. You know, the group has gotten, I remember for FACO when it passed, there was a smaller group, but you look at the individuals and you see they have been left behind and they're literally jamming behind as those forgotten behind. So it's something I think which is, is very important for us to think about. It's not only women, yes, we are disrupting and disrupting the world still, but carnival really reflects a lot of I other think, deeper issues that need to be. Sorry, if I may say, I think last lap is more about people that didn't go into for whatever reason, but when carnival passed, through, they couldn't resist. So they had to go in fact. <laughs> and sorry, yeah. they had to go yeah. in the yeah. last lap. Yeah. I think last lap, I, I can remember if I just get to <laughs> Um, my my memories with Last Lap was because my daddy used to love Carnival in one or the other way. He didn't participate in no group. Don't get me wrong, never, never wanted to go into a group. But oh my God, when Last Lap came, he went to Last Lap to say, I see you home. And he went to Last Lap. So he was that. For him, Last Lap was Carnival. So I think it's not. Left behind, I think those people like to go in last lap. They don't want to go organized. They just want to go, you know, in the last lap to bring things and and, and go and go. Okay. But I think what we're saying, kind of, if you look at it, mm -hmm. it's like a fact that you see, like the color group this and that. So like, what I think is that really important is to do research why, because maybe they don't feel accepted or they don't feel they should go in this group, like. Does I work? think there should be a research because I, I do not believe that every group say no. 
I don't think it's that. I, I, I do want to know your meaning first to know why. Because yes, like the group, I know I have I have friends like um, Shark is a very good friend of mine, and I was begging him to go with me. I'm, I'm telling him you're ambient that you would love us. No, I feel like no. He's loyal to his people. He looks at it that way. But still, he's going in another room for the different but for the first time. So for us, that's like okay, a big huge step. Yeah. And <coughs> he said it. Now I'm gonna see if I'm accepted if I feel at home. If not, it's my last year. Yeah. But maybe we should do a research about it because I would love to know the reason why. That is true. So I think a good way to start is oh, sorry, a good way to start is, is Gregory's. Yeah. A good way to think about Gregory's book. I think he kind of touched base, and in the lecture of Monday, we kind of um, touched base with that as well. But I think it's something that definitely next year um, is a good conversation to have because we need to look at carnival from different perspectives. I see one last hand, a short yeah, question, please. please. I would like to suggest to uh, address what we had before, what we used to call the job box before we had that. Okay. that time. Yes. Okay. Um, before we used to have a jump up in each barrio, each barrio had its jump up, and um, it was something everybody used to look forward to. And and it you could see it was like the coming together of the community. It it was freedom in <laughs> I, I don't know how else to express it. It was just freedom and fun and and being part of the whole carnival experience. And people from, from other districts could have joined exactly. Other exactly. Ah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah, it was hosted basically, it was hosted in a bar, but anybody could join. Yes. And it's no costume, no t shirts, no nothing, just a brass, brass band. band. Exactly, no band, either brass band, and people jumping behind. That, that was just awesome. So, on that note, I would like to thank each and one of you for being here. But I would like to draw your attention to the next lecture in this series. So we have two more um, lectures coming up. One is on Monday, October the 23rd. And um, that lecturer uh, flew in all the way from Trinidad to be here, Dr. Sharissa Granger. Um, she's sitting in the back of their hiding with locks. And she, did, <laughs> she has not removed her locks. And um, the lecture will be, as she said, a space for collective thinking about how music can be situated in a discussion of climate change um, and its effects. Can have I said it in, in a short and right way? Um, people might think music and climate change. Remember when Gregory was singing Gusa, um, Awa Yobe, Maishi Krese, you know, that's a form of incorporating music and climate. So I'm looking forward to further development. She comes from the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. Um, and she's a local born Aruban, that's the most important thing, with a PG doctor. So it's good to know that we have people who contribute to this discussion and are willing to participate. And on the, 20th, the 26th, we have uh, Dr. Charissa and Dr. Um, Gregory Richardson will be giving a presentation then on steel pan, calypso, and soca in the bacchanal space. Um, pleasure as resistance. And that we are taking Pariva de Brug. That will be at school, the Arte. So I hope to see each and every one of you. And I would like to take an opportunity also again to really thank um, everyone who has made this first um, um, possible. We have um, IPA, the Konlika Institute for Tal in Leiden, uh, NVO, Musica, the Culture, Islanders of the Realm. Um, I think we, that, was it Omasib the last time? broadcasted in Telaruba for um, willing to contribute. I think this is a very good discussion. I really, really hope that this can be continued next year um, in a good vibe. And I do agree with, and we're all little kids, whether it's carnival or not, wanting to feel part of a community, wanting to be seen, wanted to be accepted, wanted to be respected. So on that note, and on behalf of the University of Uber, I thank you very much for participating. Dwayne, thank you very much. I don't know if you have one last word that you might to say. No, I just want to say thank you for being including me as part of this group. I feel very privileged and very honored to 
join this panel. And thank you again, uh, Deborah, for organizing all this. I know you do a lot of work behind the scenes that oftentimes people don't recognize. And uh, I'd like to recognize it because I know how hard you started working on this way back in September when I was there. You started the, the conversation with Gregory and myself, and this is the germination of it all. So congratulations to you on a great seminar series, and I appreciate all that you do at the uh, University of Rua. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Good evening. Good evening.